So I'll talk today. What is herbicide resistance? This is like herbicide resistance 101. Herbicide resistance can be confused with other things. So we've just got to get our definition right. Uh, another one we can talk about a bit, and I'm sure we will field some questions about how does flupropanate work. We sort of know. Um, we don't know everything, but we've got Warwick mentioned something about leaching in the, in the profile. I totally agree with that. But there's, if we can explain how it works, um, that can explain some spray failures. Um, sometimes it doesn't work and you've done everything you can do in your, in your hands to possibly get it to work, but the season doesn't work out that way. How we got flupropanate resistance? Well, I can, in summary, tell you that you use flupropanate a lot. That's one short, sweet summary. But we'll go through a little bit of the science, basic science. Um, implications of resistance. Um, your whole world might change once you just have confirmation of flu paper resistance on your farm. Um, most of the work that was shown today was based on flu paper actually working. What happens when it doesn't work? Oh my God, some people might say. That will, could, could put a massive spanner in your operation. Oops, new treatments. I've been fortunate enough in the last three or four years to have a project funded by New South Wales DPI to look at some of the modes of action of herbicides, all the ones that you may not have heard about, but were also previously researched by those in Vic DPI and also New South Wales DPI. From previous research, I've just amalgamated their work and actually tested it under field conditions. Um, how to best use these treatments. It might be an idea for future researchers to put these new treatments into farming systems or pasture systems and see if they actually are robust enough to actually work. And we'll have a discussion or key points from my talk. Okay, so I, I threw the question out to people. Flu paper has probably been out since the mid-70s. It was an ICI compound. I was fortunate enough to walk around with an old um, company rep back then called Jeff Hillier, who went through all my trials, not on serratitasic, but on other weeds, cooler type grass, chili and noodle grass. And he told me how it worked quite well. And I, got, I gained a lot. Now, in, um, in the old days, it's a perfect chemical for those that are managing tussocky weeds in a pasture. Almost perfect. It, um, it doesn't have any sort of specific growth stage requirements. You can hit big plants, small plants. So long as you've got a bit of pasture there, I wouldn't recommend using it on a monoculture of weed because it is mildly selective. As we know, it leaves certain pasture species behind. So you can put it out. It does a pretty good job. Come back, regardless of your management, I suppose it does come back eventually in bits and pieces. You can come back and reapply. You do that cycle every three, four, five or six years. That's fine um, until it breaks down. The system breaks down if you got, develop or find plants that have a natural ability to tolerate it. So this is a picture here from Armadale. Surprisingly enough, up in northern Tablelands, we've got a pretty good population up there. Not big, but it can survive a 12 litre rate of flupropanate. What it will do is die back and then reshoot quite nicely. Um, that was in a pretty good year. Started off dry, but then it got some rainfall, just enough to activate it through the right time of the year, which is spring, summer. It died back only about two months later, and then I saw bad signs of it coming back. So, what would you do if you had flu paper resistance in a paddock? This is Mount David, southwest of Oberon, and you've got no flu paper to use. That's what you do if you get glyphosate, if you put glyphosate out. Um, that's the only really main alternative you've got in terms of chemicals. You'll kill, you'll kill the plants, then you'll get a whole lot of thistles come up, or rubbish. Um, that's a whole lot of variegated thistles. Actually, the seedlings didn't come back very strongly the first year because it was a whole mulch effect of weeds and rubbish all over the place. But once that all broke down, serrated tussock started to come back. Not a very nice option, not very productive. Um, you wouldn't get your stock to eat variegated thistles unless you spray grazed or put a, 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 you know, a herbicide out. So that's what we're missing out on, selectivity. Once we go from flupropanate to our 
alternatives. <coughs> Current practice, and I'm pushing the chemical thing a bit. We do know that we have um, people like Warwick and that promoting the pasture competition. I'm not sure how actively we do that, but hopefully with the work that's coming out from their research unit, they'll um, actively manage their pastures to get a competition. But at them, I don't know what breakup it is, but I'd say mainly through propionate is, if you had a herbicide choice, would possibly be 90 something percent of the marketplace. But I'm hearing from Peter and a few others, people are spotting it with glyphosate as well. Um, so you can imagine the amount of selection pressure or applications of flupropanate we're using. We've been putting it on heli by helicopter, granules, this is flupropanate that is, spotting or normal boom applications. Okay, um, this is where a lot of people get lost and we've d we got lost in the past in, in the good old days when, when we first had resistant weeds in a cropping sense couple of decades ago. Um, it's a ability of a weed to survive a herbicide that in the old days, before herbicide, herbicides come along, um, it's an ability of the weed to survive relative to what would have been expected in the past. So we've basically selected, it's like evolution in slow motion, we've selected plants in a population, and it might be a very rare few individuals, or it might be very low levels of tolerance where we let them breed up, but eventually, over a period of time, it might be one plant and a couple of hundred thousand, which may have a slight ability to survive flupropanate. This is where the question comes along when you're using half rates or low dose rates and things like that, what, what sort of implications you have is that you'll let some of those plants survive at the expense of the greater majority of the population in which are uh, susceptible. We're all not the same. We're all not, um, we're all not uniform in a population. So if you put a selection pressure on, you are going to get a few individuals that will probably survive an application. Not due to poor herbicide performance, which is the second point there. We've heard about flupropanate, and I'm sure there's many a story here that flupropanate hasn't worked. It could be a couple of years in a row, it might be just one year out of um, 10 that you've put it on, it just didn't work. But then you come back the following year, it works. So there's something else going on in terms of um, discerning between resistance and poor performance. Um, I'm sure there's many cases, we, we heard about the boomless jet being used today. I'm sure it's got issues with shading from rocks or trees as you go past and there'll be plants that are shaded. There'll be some, some plants surviving that. Um, there'll be wheel tracks. There'll be things like that or half chew down plants that might not get enough or it just might be a drought and a whole lot of the flupropanate doesn't work. It might only kill half the plants. So that's very hard for the inexperienced people who haven't seen resistance in the field to know what they're looking at. What I've seen is, in my experience, is resistance with this sort of weed would be quite patchy. If you're getting a moderate kill, if that, up on the hills but down on the flats it's near perfect, I'd start to be questioning things. And if that keeps on happening every application of flu propionate or slowly getting worse each year, I'd be very concerned. So you will get some dead plants amongst live plants, but you will, will get some ugly patches in your paddock. That's highly likely what resistance looks like. It's all nice sobering thoughts I'm giving today. I'm sorry about this as the last presentation, but it is science and it is what's happening. That's, that's what it's all about. So as I said, any population has a small proportion of plants that have possibly got some ability to survive. You don't put a herbicide out and it doesn't cause a mutation. That's just rubbish. There's just, there's variation in the population. That's all there is. What you do, and unfortunately, with the cycle that we've, I'll show you in the next couple of slides, um, we repeat the same herbicide every time and don't mix it up. That's how you get resistance pretty quickly. I've just said those points there. Okay, herbicide resistance is not survival due to shading from other weeds. I've gone through that. 
Here's a classic photo at the Tamworth Ag Research Station. And we've probably gone in there when it was a little bit too muddy or dusty. Put some glyphosate out in a fallow paddock and you get your nice wheel tracks. I'm not going to be convinced that someone comes up to me and say, oh, I think that's resistance. I'd say highly unlikely it is. Look at the wheel tracks. Plants don't want to select themselves down wheel ruts. Um, poor spraying. This is probably one of the most common ones. It's not necessarily your fault, it might be just the environment after you put your flu propionate out. Because you're in a lap of the gods, so to speak. You're putting out a herbicide which is sort of post-emergent and pre-emergent. Soil uptake, root uptake. Well, you can't con control the environment thereafter. You can control a few things, the timing and the rate, but you can't control droughts. So unfortunately, you don't get always the same control every time you put it out. Um, Clumsy, I put clumsy spot treatment techniques. So, you know, if you spray from your car and your hands out and you're just missing patches here and there, you're likely to miss a few. And always when you spot spray, you're going to miss a few plants. So be careful of that. You have to, as Peter said, come back and re in, um, investigate what you've done soon after if you can. The label states don't spray stressed plants. And that's clear, that means it's, you've got drought disease. Um, some people have been known to mix chemicals with flupropanate. In the north, they've been known to mix it with glyphosate. They've also been known to mix it with paraquat, which is another herbicide. And that can sometimes, particularly that second combination, be mildly antagonistic, a little bit antagonistic. This is the big no-no. Um, if you want to get a slow form of resistance called creeping resistance, I won't go through a resistance lecture. I gave Claire one only recently, but you can, if you want forms of resistance, don't use half dose or low doses all the time repeatedly. It's, a, it's certainly a way of getting resistance. So I hope in this audience our awareness um, might be just on the periphery here. I'll tell you what, people's awareness certainly rockets through the centre pretty quickly once they have a confirmed case either in their farm, in their farm or, or near adjacent farms around their district. Um, I don't know what the issue is at the moment in the central tablelands. I don't think there's any official confirmed cases yet, but I've heard of people wondering whether their sprays are working. So at the moment, we know it's in the northern tablelands, we know it's in the Goulburn region and it's quite bad in the Goulburn region where there's several thousand hectares where it's possibly a full monoculture. So um, that's where I was in 1990s. I probably was out in the edge. I, didn't, I heard about it but didn't think much about it. And as we know, and this is sometimes we still make the same mistakes, even the people that had glyphosate resistance used to rotate from Roundup CT to Powermax and then a whole range of different glyphosate-based products thinking that they're doing some wonderful thing. And it's still glyphosate. The plant doesn't see the label, it just sees the active ingredient go into the, either the root or through the foliage. So task force equals the same as you know, granular flupropanate. So, there's reasons if you want to use granulars, I understand that, if it's a helicopter application and through trees where the granules can fall down relatively evenly. But there's also people use the liquid form maybe for economics on a, on a boom spray or spot spray application. There was another product which is still re uh, registered but rarely used, was Dalapon, and it's another herbicide, which I can't say the herbicide group, can I? But it's... Group J, this will be the scary thing. There's lots of her herbicide modes of action groups. Glyphosate's group M, and these three are group J. That's all we've got in terms of registered options at the moment. So there you go, no big range. Glyphosate group M and 2,2-DPA, which is Dalapon, which some people may have used in the past, if anyone here has used it, many, many years ago. Nowhere near as good as flupropanate. How did we get resistance? Okay, roughly 15 applications. A, a group of expert scientists use 
data and evidence on the gene frequencies of the resistant gene frequencies of of uh, of certain weeds and, and and resistance to certain herbicides, and we're guessing about sometimes 10 up to 15 applications of herbicide. And if you spread that out over a, every two or three or four years, you apply herbicides. That sort of coincides back to the 70s when flu papernate came out. That's about 30 odd years ago, 40 years ago. And if you apply it every four years or so, that could, you're basically adding up to about 15 applications, which will get you close to a resistance risk, high resistance risk. So at the moment, yes, Goulburn, there's a few red dots. There's one at Armidale there in, the, in Rawlsley Valley in Victoria. But there's probably, we haven't reinvestigated that for about 10 years. There's probably a lot of little red dots popping up and resistance surveys only show you historically what's been found and it depends how hard you look for it. You'll get more little red dots on the map. Um, clearly, the ones where they had resistance, they've had no alternative tactics used. They might have used competition in an ad hoc way or not knowing, but usually they just use flupropanate. Usually set stocking rates and let the thing seed. No worries about seed set. Come back in three years time and spray it again. Flupropanate will work, apparently. Um, maybe due to substandard conditions in harder country. And I've found a lot of resistances in my work in the grains industry on the country, which is a bit harder. Um, it dries out faster, it's rockier and stonier, so the weeds are stressed straight away. So effectively, they're not getting a full dose. They're already under a bit of pressure. So they're getting sort of like a half dose rate. And so all the really susceptible plants in that population will die out, and these ones that have got a little bit more tolerance will, will survive, and they'll breed, and they'll get to a, a certain level of tolerance so high, in fact, that they'll get to a point where they're resistant. The problem is with this weed, like a few others I know, you may not develop resistance on your place um, due to your best practices or preventative practices, you could still get it via wind movement. So on a catchment basis, this is a critical thing. So knowing that your neighbour may have a resistance issue or someone in the catchment has, you've got to be very mindful. It won't be, it won't be um, never, it'll just be a matter of time as to when it might start to blow in. And um, you, you'll always have to spot treat those out. So here we go. This is taken from uh, one of our prime facts. This is an example of a resistant individual here and, and all those darker plants are susceptible. You spray clearly, well, if you're lucky, you'll get 100% kill. But the main thing is that there's a seed bank that carries over. That susceptible, that resistant plant survives and actually re replenishes the seed bank and puts more resistant seed into the seed bank. So when you come back the following year, you'll still get some of the susceptible plants pop up which is a carryover seed bank, because the seed bank hangs around for a while, but then you start to get a higher proportion of the resistant individual. So it might only take three or four years and you'll get a, a rapid blowout, um, or three or four applications, I, I should say. This is one of the crucial tables. This links back to what Peter and a few other people have said. Um, we're, we're still, Obsessed, and I, I suppose that's the main thing. Um, all the herbicides we've used in the past were, were there to kill, kill the weed. You see the weed, you spray it, you kill it. In the cropping systems, we, we break down the weed cycle into different tactic groups. Uh, we also have some relevance here. We've got tactic group four, prevent seeds entering the seed bank. So at some stages I've heard some people make comment about spot spraying um, plants or at least stopping them setting seeds. So they're actually considering the seed bank and, and, the, and the cycle. The seed bank's down here and it comes across from here as seedlings. But we have had an obsession with flu propanate for so long that we, we can go through this cycle, wait until the, the plants build up a number and treat it again but it breaks down once your herbicides don't work. If you keep on cycling through there, your, your assumption that flupropanate is good will unfortunately fail. Um, there may be some tactics out there that people have spotted their um, serratotussic in hilly country or even uh, monoculture somewhere 
where they might not be trying to kill the plant but just stop setting seed. Consider that in some of those heavy country, you know, high country, steep country where you can't actually get to. It's, it is a seed source, but it might be, might be worth considering seeing if you can stop at least that setting seed with a, a treatment. Um, quarantine's important. Um, you know, don't rush out and buy stock that you think is from a high, high risk area where they've got a lot of flu propionate resistance to And quarantine might also mean paddock to paddock, or it might mean farm to farm. Um, okay, the implications of resistance. Since we only have two herbicides left in our arsenal at the moment, and you lose one of them, you've only got one left, which is glyphosate. So I've been saying this for years um, to others, and I'm, I'm quite concerned about the serratotussic issue. I can look at the glyphosate-resistant ryegrass as a comparison in the cropping country. They've still got modes of action from various herbicide groups that are still registered. So they've lost one tool and they've probably got six or seven left. In serratotussic, we've had to. In some cases, you lose one. You've only got one left, and that's, that's very concerning. <clears throat> We've got to understand, and I will show you the herbicides I've developed, the treat treatments I've developed and hopefully got a permit for in coming months, how to use these new treatments. Um, there may be stigmas associated, and there's a lot of psychology goes on with herbicide resistance in the early days in the cropping country that some people may have kept it harsh or they didn't want others to know they had resistance. So there's a, a human nature aspect where people may want to just keep that quiet and just not tell anyone and that's not good on a community basis. It'll be nice to be open. And that's what happens in the grain industry now. People know it's out there and they openly say, we've got resistance to this, 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 and I'll try their best. <clears throat> that's going to be the issue. Uh, that will be for people like the weeds officers and the LLS and and even New South Wales DPIs to get their heads together in particular catchments where there's a little patch where it's starting to get bad. Big issue again is do I have a resistance? Do I have resistance or spray failure? We don't have any system set up yet for, for clients or farmers to put in some samples to get them tested. Nothing official yet. We need to go to the step one, do I have a problem? We don't have anything at this point to say, Here's a testing service for you guys. We're working on that, so hopefully one day we can look at finding and getting past step one. Do I have a problem? And where has resistance spread to once you've first found it? That's more for New South Wales DPI or LLS, more of a government thing. Um, what advice is there for affected people? My goodness, there'll be a scramble now to look at alternative treatments and, and have a set of treatments hopefully available for people that may have a, a patch of flu propionate resistant serratotussic. Anyway, I'm on to this next one, segue onto um, need to find alternative treatments, which is my project. Here's just a quick slide. Now we could test for resistance using live plants, but more often than not you'll probably need 30 or 40 or 50 plants. And if someone wants to mail me 30, 40 or 50 serratotussic plants, I'll need a a big truck to come down and then I've got to pop them all in and let them stabilise and then I spray them with flu propionate which is just slow and takes time. Then you get your, put your results back in two years from then. So we're not going to likely go down that track with chunky big plants plus half of them some tend to die in the post by the time they come to me. And it's just not, not a good way to go. I'd rather go, even though they're not serratotussic seeds, um, there has been a test done by David McLaren and a whole range of his cohorts um, down Victorian DPI where they put seeds in petri dishes with dilutions of flupropanate and they have, that's a susceptible population, it just, that's a shoot length and that just drops off really quickly with increasing rate and here's all these other populations that manage to survive and have nice long shoots and I can see a difference in the population. So that's just known susceptible and these ones are resistant. So you can give seed, and I think you needed 300 seed, um, put it at, and apply at different rates and then you can work out reasonably quickly and you can easily send 300 seeds in the post. Yep, yep. So that's a little, little bit more rapid, user-friendly, if we have to do a resistance testing service. 
Um, this is my project. Now, narrowing down the list of alternatives now. This may or may not be depressing. It's just fact. <laughs> um, there are 21 modes of action of herbicide. Wow, there's a lot to choose from. So out of all the letters of the alphabet, we go from group A down to group Z, and we miss out from group S down to group Y or something like that. They're not herbicide modes of action. He, here's some of them. So you've got a whole range of herbicide modes of action, and many of which you're probably not aware of. Some you may have heard of. Um, a lot of them have been developed in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And since the early 1980s, no new mode of action herbicides have been made. So a regular question in the croppings scene was, is there a silver bullet, a new herbicide that will save us? Um, answer's probably not likely, okay? So, moving on. At least some of these herbicides I'll go through have found that some people from Queen, uh, Victorian DPI and also New South Wales Ag have found that herbicides in these top two groups have been shown to show some really good control on serrated tussock. Mind you, some of the studies were done in glass houses, which isn't really super realistic, and some were done in the field, but then the herbicides were applied with a watering can. Not really exactly realistic. So I'll grab some of the data from those papers, also put a few of my own little special treats in there, just to see from different modes of action. And some of these are just culled. You're not going to get 2,4-D to kill a grass. It kills broadleaf. So a lot of these were just culled out of common sense. So we didn't still have a big range. Um, I did consider cost. I did consider likelihood of adoption and all these other factors in thinning out my list of herbicide treatments. And once, if I got some new treatments, there's a state permit, which has been renewed recently, but doesn't have some new treatments. Um, we can get the permit or the new treatment, treatments put on a permit relatively quickly. So a permit is an off-label use to use something. So even though the label doesn't state use this herbicide on serrated tussock, you can have an off-label permit and then you're allowed to use it, which is very quick, which is important. Whole list of experiments, not too many, because um, we only had a couple of years for this um, project. And we basically, in essence, had them spread over the state, from Armidale, Mount David, Breadbow, Goulburn. Breadbow again, like Breadbow, seems to go well there. Nothing else does, except for African lovegrass and serrated tussock. So um, we did our work in about the 19, uh, 19, 2012 to 2013. Didn't have much time. And we looked at spot treating herbicides. We also looked at boom treating herbicides. We, we don't just look at just one application type. Um, mainly with group A herbicides in there. And I have written the word Im imazamox or imi herbicides, which are group B. So basically biased towards group A and B chemistry. The first trial, which was on that table, was at Armidale, where we looked at a lot of group A herbicides. And we spot treated them. We found out that we saw some effect, but we didn't have our rates high enough, in summary. Haloxifop, no one, unless it um, has used Verdict before, or anyone heard of Verdict, you could use it in Lucent or Clover stands to get rid of grasses. That's the active ingredient. That was the most promising herbicide. The others weren't too bad, but we, we quickly dropped those off the, the program, because we're not going to waste our time looking at something that's a bit ordinary. Glyphosate was still the best spot treatment. Hooray, of course. This population was the one that was resistant to at least 12 litres of flupropanate. Not far from Armadale Airport. Um, both 2,2-DPA and flupropanate, which are in group J, didn't work. It was, um, they did die back, as I said, and they regrew. So that was a very quick snapshot. We said there's some promise there. We could investigate this, this particular herbicide a little bit more. We did it again at Armidale, and the green, the green means it's, that's a brownout, which is just the first visual look. 31 days after treatment, that's what 31 DAT is, 31 days after treatment, a month after application. A lot of these treatments were starting to show moderate brownout. They're still green down the guts of the plants, but a lot of the foliage had basically died. Um, glyphosate was good, we came back uh, 76 days later, even the glyphosate wasn't good because we had seedlings come through. 
that just goes hand in hand. That's a glyphosate there. It was really good at the start. Seedlings came through. Um, Haloxifot, which is the verdict, was still showing some promise 76 days after treatment. So two and a half months thereabouts. It was good at, at a, that certain rate, so we decided to look at it one more time and step the rate up just a little bit more. This is a spot spray trial at Mount David, so you know, a couple of hours down the road. Um, this is no, no product, and that was 81 um, percent of the foliage which was green. You never get serrated tussock 100 percent green. We just estimated a percent green in each tussock and did over 30 plants, I think, in a large area. We used 80 mils of haloxifop or verdict, then we went 120 mils and then 160 mils. And that was, uh, I don't know how many days after treatment, it was a significant time after treatment, about half a year, and that rate actually killed, started to kill a lot of plants. So we just didn't get enough herbicide onto those plants with that particular herbicide. That's what it looks like, untreated control, 80 mils, you see the odd one die, and then 120 mils, and then we go up to 160 mil rate per 100 litres of water, and reasonably happy. The really good thing about Haloxifop or Verdict is if you have clovers nearby, you're not going to kill them. Whereas well, so I did the same with glyphosate, well, you just kill everything around that spot. So at least it gives you some degree of pasture competition around each tussock, which is good. Experiment four. Well, I thought I'd try these Group A herbicides, and this is down at Breadbow. And I thought I'd try these Group A herbicides as a boom spray treatment and then follow up with a, another treatment which is supposed to take a lot of the foliage off it. It basically failed because I couldn't get enough Group A herbicide on the plant. You can't legally put a high enough rate on to kill these tussock plants. So we're not going to go down the road of putting Verdict out through a boom spray. You just can't put enough on. This is an important trial. This one was down at Goulburn, and this is where we looked at residual herbicides. Because we, we've, we've been obsessed by killing plants that we can see. We thought we'd spray an area out with glyphosate, which had a fair bit of serrated tussock, and we put a lot of, lot of treatments out, which are all residual, so they, they work on the germinating seedling. Um, which is what you'll need if you have flupopinate resistance, because it won't work. You'll lose your residual ability. You've only got glyphosate left. You'll need something with residual. There's a whole range of Group B chemistries, and all those herbicide actives have got an IMI in front of them. Don't worry about the product names or whatever. The most important thing, they work quite well. And 10 months after treatment, reasonably good control. That's a year down the track. Um, and that's exactly what Malcolm Campbell and David McLaren found in their work way back in the early 2000s to mid 2000s. They found that those products were quite effective. I've just reiterated that and shown them. There was a few others that worked, um, but only worked like a flash in the pan and they didn't last the, the distance, like 10 months. And there's some that work, but they wouldn't succeed, like sulfametron, which is used for the roadsides and it does total veg control, so it just kills everything. So you wouldn't want to use that. So that was scratched. Last experiment, yet again, it was at Breadbow and compared to Goulburn, because when you do trials, you like to have some replication over different environments, different years. And yet again, those herbicides that were listed in the previous ones that did well, Imazapire, Imazapic, Imazamox, all nice, all start with Emmy, all did very well. And that was uh, five months after treatment. So very high levels of control, 90 to 100% control, which is not too bad for a pre-emergent herbicide. So in summary for, the, for these treatments, um, it was Verdict 520, which we use, and we're going for the permit application. It's in the system. We just can't promise what the, how the time frame for the APVMA. At 160 mils per 100 litres of water plus uptake, and we're spot treating, only spot treating. We can't put it as a boom, otherwise you'd be drowning the plants with too much active ingredient uh, and wasting a lot. It won't be economical. Raptor, which is the imazamox, which is the active ingredient, which is selective at 50 grams a hectare, and spinnaker, 
which is also very closely loaded product, um, at 70 to 140 grams. So they're good in a, a, a pulse situation or a legume situation. They provide a lot of safety to things like clovers. Um, they do kill grasses. If you've only got young seedling pasture grasses, you'll knock them. But if you've got established grasses, it's, they seem to have a lot more tolerance and they can grow through that. I put up some basic scenarios. This is the main one. I just thought of some scenarios. If you had flupropanate resistance. Um, now, I know there's lots of cases where you'd have it up a hill and you can't get onto it and spray it. They're going to be the, they're going to be the big issues with any sort of flupropanate resistance. There's going to be some areas where you just can't treat it or you'll just have to minimise its impact some other way. But in a case where you've got a monoculture or, or pretty well a large infestation and you can get a boom spray onto it, um, we're more likely going to, if it gets down to it, spray the whole lot out with glyphosate. Because you're not, you can't, you don't have any other options. You don't have, you can't put verdict out through a burn, and there's nothing else registered. We'd like to incorporate something in terms of pasture competition. Put something on straight away. Now those herbicides I found that were quite residual and had some good activity. You cannot suddenly put a grass pasture in straight away. You'll snot it. You'll kill it. So you have to put at least some legume in there to start the system rolling. Um, apply those herbicides, either one of those herbicides at the desired pasture stage, which is usually once your legumes are just out of the ground a little bit, you will get a, odd, um, you'll get a seedling emergence of some of these serrated tussock plants. You'll kill a high proportion of them, but you will get to the point where you have a, you know, individual serrated tussock plants that you'll have to spot spray. That goes then links with Warwick's talk about spot spraying. You have to follow up. You can't let these plants survive. They'll end up getting big, start setting seed in a couple of years, and then they'll start the cycle again. Um, I show that you can kill large serrated tussock with Verdict or Haloxifop, but if you, you, you should be able to spot some about a smaller stage. They, they would be quite more susceptible. But after a bit of time, you'll, you can get away, obviously, introduce a, some sort of grass into your system. You can't just totally rely on that for the first, you can do, do that for the first year, but reasonably soon after, hopefully, introduce some sort of grass pasture component. A perennial grass pasture component would be nice. Um, at least in coming months, we'll have four modes of action to use on serrated tussock. Only three if you've got resistance, but you've got four. So we double the, the um, options available to growers, which is good instead of having two. Um, flu propionate's out there, resistance. It's out there. We don't know exactly where it is fully in terms of the full picture. Don't know about the central tablelands, but it's definitely an issue down south. Life has, will, will require a little bit more activity. It was a great talk by Peter. He went out and kept his numbers quite low. He didn't spray fields of serrated tussock and then put herbicides out. His selection pressure would have been quite low. If you only got a moderate amount of serrated tussock and you're spotting it and stopping them from setting seed, which is most important, that'll go a long way. So he got on, he got on that. He won't eradicate it, but he's close to it and he'll always have it as a maintenance spray. Um, we need to road test these herbicides. It's nice to see them in plots. Maybe a few other researchers out there thinking, maybe how can we incorporate some of these in a, in a system somewhere? Will they work? I need to know that. I need to see if they work in a, in a, in a, in a grazing sense. Um, and once you lose one herbicide, you've only got three left, you start putting pressure on the remaining three. That just goes without saying. We need people to look for it a bit more, look for the um, signals, uh, the signs, the, the live plants and then dead plants beside it or nice patches that are happy. Um, be alert, don't be worried about telling people, please. The sooner you can alert someone, the better. Um, if you do see only one or two plants that are suspect, yeah, pull them out, make sure they don't even set seed. Don't sit there and go, oh, you know. You, you can sit there and think about it, but. Maybe if it was a hectare, you can have an opportunity of getting some seed off that. But if you have one or two suspect plants, pull them out. We do need a resistance testing service. 
Um, pl the plants don't say, hello, I'm resistant, oh, I'm susceptible. They don't have little signals like that. It's quite hard to discriminate and you need a reasonable experiment to sort out the differences. Thank you very much. Sobering, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. good news. Good The idea of having paraquat with a systemic is what they use in the cropping country is called double knock. Where you put it and, and we've got some weeds out there, I'll name a few. Uh, windmill grass and feather top rose, where we've used herbicides like Verdict and then come back about a week to two weeks later with Paraquat. So you get a systemic herbicide to work its way in and affect the growing point and then take off a lot of foliage with your spray seed, which is a desiccant. And it was doing a great job on the fallow weeds such as barnyard grass, liver seed grass, feather top rose. But when I did it here, it just doesn't work. I was hoping that would work to double knock a paddock. Um, there may be options still to use paraquat on very small seedlings in a pasture sense, but you've got to, you certainly, it still causes a lot of hassle, um, a lot of damage to young um, legume pastures, so uh, not likely to succeed. The other point with paraquat is that they're S7s, so you shouldn't be using them in a spot spray situation. Oh, definitely, it has to be a boom. You've got a boom where you've got, you know, the inflow of air into your cabins filtered and so you don't get any. They're, they're definitely not registered for spot treatment, paraquat. Um, yeah, so the situation's out there. I'm, I'm confident there may be some more work later to look at maybe some other herbicide modes of action. One or two researchers have said, why didn't you try this other herbicide? But it's only one or two other herbicides. Um, but at the moment, um, I think if you treat your farm and, and have z close to zero tolerance and you probably put more, a few more days in your working year, not devote your life to it, but put an extra few days into scouting and maintaining it and, and just keeping those isolated patches out of your really valuable country would go a long way. Because you do have a lot of other critical farming enterprises you have to work and maintain. Um, I, I understand that. I think this is a bit of a because I asked you before about this one, but um, imidazoline chemistries, how, um, what's the effect they have on native grasses? Well, most of the work I've done with those, um, on the label they're registered for early post-emergent to pre-emergent control of grasses. But once, uh, once you get a bit of, par once your pastures are, particularly perennials, which are more favourable, but um, once they're, once they're established and got a large root system and go down, they, they may go yellow and a little bit sickly, but they'll recover at, uh, at the expense of the, the smaller pasture grasses or grass weeds. So yet again, it probably highlights back to what Warwick said. If you had a perennial pasture system, they would probably most likely survive that quite easily um, and, and recover at the expense of you know, the, the weeds, really. So... So that needs to be tested. It's a new world for someone like a researcher out there that can try these in different situations. Um, that's, that's all we've got really. Um, you know, all those other modes of action, some are very expensive, some just won't work on grasses, so we've just ruled, put a ruler through it. Um, um, it's all about keeping the numbers as low as you can. There's nothing worse if you want to sleep through resistance by spraying fields and fields of serrated tussock with flu propionate and just recycle that every three or four years. It's, it, you're better off keeping the numbers low um, and, and you get all those other pasture benefits. You don't get the weed sort of impacting severely on your pasture. It's all good. So it does happen. Think of the cropping people. Look, there are some weeds out there that uh, wild radish have got resistance to five modes of action and ryegrass. So you can go out there and put verdict out or select, doesn't work. And glean and ally, low glean, doesn't work. Treflan, it doesn't work. Glyphosate, it doesn't work. And sometimes, some cases, um, paraquat, it doesn't work. Um, so they've really, they've really abused their herbicide modes of action a lot more so um, we just don't have as many 
fallback options, that's the only problem. Yes, sir. Is there anything, um, uh, so tank mixing um, Roundup and um, Flupopinate, is there, uh, is there any problem with that, you know, uh, in the mode of action on the plant? Is there any reason why we shouldn't do it? Well, th th that's a very good question, and that's um, full marks for that question, because some people have been known to have resistance, let's say resistance to one mode of action. They tend to use, in, what they've done in the cropping system, they tend to use a half rate of one and then a half rate of another. <laughs> so if you've got resistance to one, then you're relying on a half rate for the other to give you control. But in your question, I, I'm hoping if people want to have a backup, um, I like glyphosate. It, it's, t it's taking the selectivity out of your flupropanate, but if you're spot spraying, um, it, it's fast acting. So if you're coming in a bit late and their panicles are out, but they're not they don't have viable seed, you've probably got a very good chance at least stopping seed set immediately because glyphosate's translocated over the whole plant within 24 hours. So it'll go into the seed and render those inactive or non-viable. Um, but what's the point of maybe putting food propionate in if the glyphosate's doing all the work is the question. Well, that's, that's possible. It'll, it'll have a halo effect. And I know how, well, we know how fluid propionate works. It'll, if you put it on too heavy, you'll get that halo effect and end up getting a whole lot of broadleaf weeds and rubbish, but no grasses, and that's what happens when you dose it pretty hard. Um, it'll give you some residual, uh, uh, but you'll end up with clovers and possibly thistles and rubbish come through. Um, but then again, it's only, any treatment is only as good as its follow-up, really. So you can do that and then you've got to come back for those seedlings. That's the most critical thing. Has that left everyone cheery and happy? <laughs> um, just go on a website and look at, um, well, you can go on the uh, herbicideresistance.org, which is International Register of Resistant Weeds, and you'll see all the other countries are suffering it. Um, also, you can look at the Glyphosate Sustainable Working Group, which I'm on, and that just looks at glyphosate resistant weeds. And you've got graphs of all the weeds, and they're just going up like that, different species, and, and they're going up and up, and it's not reversible. I can't get, suddenly wave a wand on a plant and make it susceptible again. So, um, it, it is out there, just be aware of it. But there are, there's lots of information from other sources that can sort of link to anyone that may have any resistance issues. It's quite big, Tony. We started off the day with cold steel and we're back at it, aren't we? Look, that's what, look, that's what they're doing in Western Australia um, and they're using a lot of non-chemical tactics. Yeah. They've almost flogged everything else out. They've still got a couple of herbicides, but they're either mulled ploughing their country and, and burying the seed all the way down, about a foot under the ground, where the seeds can't get up, or they're burning their stubble or harvesting the weed seed and mashing it all up in a, uh, a grinder. Yeah, so, so that's, that's what you've got to think outside the box. It's not all chemical. We'll, and, you know, crop competition or pasture competition is very important in that early stages, but there will always be one or two that come through, and we've got to scout those out. Burn, so yeah, don't get confused. Yeah. Burning stubble is a, is a pretty good thing a lot of the time. It helps with take all and other sorts yeah. of diseases in cereals. Pe yeah. But burning tussock, don't do it, folks. Just all you do is you make a massive seed bed for it to come back. Yeah, because in, in a cropping system, they're going to re sow and put some crop in there and it's going to grow in six months and then die off. They harvest it and they'll do this. But in a pasture sense, the only time you only would ever burn is if you're really going to commit yourself to you're going to re renovate your pastures again. It's so bad, you could possibly burn, but you're going to, you commit to yourself to starting again. You wouldn't do it as a once off and just hope your pastures regenerate. No, it just makes things worse. Mm. If you apply the food properly when the plant is just about to start seeding, right? Is that in the seeds? Tough call. Just about is a vo loose sort of term. Um, it's slow, act it's moderately slow acting. It's sort of, if it doesn't rain, you're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> uh, you've got risk everywhere, you know. Um, but if just assume in a perfect world you put it on and you've got an inch of rain soon after, which is great. 
it'll start working within a month or two and, and probably you might get there. But I'd, I'd do a preemptive one and try and get it just before you know, even when the panicles are about to come out, which may be in September or, or somewhere like that. September, October is probably a nice time. But are you that, going to say that the Peter's comments earlier today, it's better off being much more proactive in the meeting than a lot earlier. Yep. And that's certainly why um, we were five and leave holders of our great techniques later this evening. We always have to be like saying the meeting is at the Tony session, the first lecture at the Tony Session. Yep. Yep. So the Tony Session plan basically is lower than this island, and you'll get um, the sort of seeds on the side. Yeah. That's exactly right. They have milky dough stage, which is what they call it. You just pinch it and if the seed squishes between your fingers. Glyphosate will work very fast. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I know it's not all good news, but um, it's... Process. Well, initially, there's two things. There's one to alert people like Sean or yourself that you've, you think you've got it. There's going to be a lot of false positives where someone says, I've got resistance, I've got resistance, and hopefully it isn't resistant, but that's better than doing nothing because you've got a chance that you've got resistance but you do nothing about it. So one is at least collect some seed from them if you can, but immediately if you even suspect resistance, don't let another season go by where they set seed. So try and do something. If you think you've got resistance and it's a patch that you, you can get, I think it's worth your time. Hitting with glyphosate somewhere, some way before it actually has a chance to set seed. Hopefully it's not too late. Um, maybe keep a few plants only where, where you allow them to set seed so you can actually get some and send them off for testing. But treat the vast almost a whole lot, but leave a few so you can rip some seed out and then kill the plant. Um, Otherwise, there's no seed to test. But it would be good if, 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 if you assume you've had two or three bad runs with flupropanate and you've had a bad run where you've had a, a good season. Um, yeah, I wouldn't hesitate to start s stopping seed set. If you stop seed set, the genes for resistance can't then blow all over your farm and everyone's neighbouring farm. Um, that's what we say. But if you've got hectares of it, that's a bit of a concern. Like hectares of flupropanate resistance, hopefully not. You might only have a few suspect patches that are half the size of this shed or you know, dinner table size or something like that. You've got a good chance of easily stopping that from setting seed. Okay. Thank How you. How long is the seed viable for? Pardon? How long is the seed viable for? Well, that's a good call. I haven't seen the studies on Australia Tussock, but I know other than the sellers, I think they decline at 30, 40% a year, and it's not that good. Oh, Warwick knows. Yeah, um, so best conditions, so storing it on a, a shelf in a lab, it'll last for 12 years. Yeah. But the work that's been done in the field shows that uh, you're losing, uh, it's, it's in the order of something we're between. 50 to 70 percent of your seed in the first year, so either germinates or decays. So, yep. so you actually, it, it, it's, a, it's an exponential decay. So you're losing most of your seed in the first couple of years. So, so what? So in the first three to four years, of you, you you you'll have very little seed left if you've got no, nothing going in. From what was there, you might still have stuff blowing in. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. yeah. That just gives you a bit of an idea if you when you restart. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no. If you can keep it out, you'll, the first two years you'll lose most of your seed, and if you got it clear for three or four, you, you'd have very little seed left. Yeah. Gives you an idea if you're winning, because you don't lose up, lose hope. You might be doing a great job, but the, if you've got ten thousand seeds per square metre, and uh, you're down to five thousand the first year, and then two and a half thousand the next year, you know. But hopefully you get it down. And a lot of the seeds are fatal germinators, as Warwick said, they'll germinate and die, hopefully, and. Just keep the pressure on, you'll get, you'll get to that tail end eventually. You might always have one seed, and as you say, someone said you'll get a blow in or two as well. But it'll have to be part of a, a regular part of your, you know, add a few extra days here and there as a spot spraying thing. I can't place the emphasis on that. I could spray flu paper, mate. If I had a farm that was only 100 hectares, I could spray, spray it every second year and not, 
Worry about resistance so much because it's only as good as your follow-up treatment. I can go and spray it and make sure nothing survives and pull it out, should be right. But if I do nothing and let it set seed, that's a big risk. So put more em emphasis into spot spraying and, and roguing out those plants. You don't have to worry about dormancy and that during winter. You can spray it any time? Yeah, mm. all year round. Yeah. So long as it knocks it significantly and really sets it back, if it doesn't completely kill it, you can always come back and knock it again and send it on its way. It's an amazing plant though, Tony. Like you can go and spray it in the middle of summer, every other plant is stressed. Yeah. And uh, still get quite a good result. Now, I think I think what Peter said of, of actually incorporating it into his daily management means that because everyone's probably been there where you've gone. Suddenly, I'll just go back and get it, and you, you don't, you don't do it. So I think that, that, that attitude of just not, not, not driving past it, you're got to that level, is a really important thing. Okay. <laughs>